step programs and at my first my first look into 12 step programs it was like you know the first step in there so I'm powerless and as a math user I didn't feel like I was powerless I felt like with a really good head start and run and jump I could fly from one building to the next I didn't feel powerless so 12 step programs just didn't seem like they were going to work for me because I just I couldn't I was in a lot of denial and that drug puts you in a lot of denial it does some terrible things to your brain chemistry. And I was very blessed to just, you know, I'm going to take this in my own hands 
And I'm going to research this, and I found another way to start into recovery. And what I found was I believe. Uh, I didn't know a lot about it at first. I didn't know anything about it at first. At first, it was a total mystery to me. Um, and I started reading about it. I started researching, and I started finding out that it's it's being you know it's being used as a treatment around the world. It's not being used here in the United States, and that fueled my interest because anytime the United States says something is bad, you know everybody says oh, well, if everybody else is doing it, let's look into it because our country seems so arrogant sometimes in that they just don't want to learn from what the rest of the world is doing with their success happening around the world. And at that point, I was like, you know what, I, I didn't know, I, I needed something. I didn't want to die. Uh, I'd lived through way too much at that point to die. So I took, I took a leap of faith. And I took a small mortgage on my house. And I went to Tijuana. Actually, I spent, I spent a while in communications with a wonderful woman named Claire. And it was, it was a little difficult explaining to my friends. They would say, okay, well, they said, let me get this straight. You're going to, you're going to fly out of the country. You're going to fly to Mexico to have an experimental drug treatment by strangers and by yourself. And normally I would have said, you know, this sounds, that, that sounds a little scary. But this wonderful woman gave me a tremendous amount of faith in the process. And I felt comfortable. And I did it. I went down there and I did this treatment. And you know, I had a, I used to have a test for myself because most addicts will tell you that if it if they wake up in the morning and it's raining outside, that's a good reason to call your dealer. <laughs> and just make sure you know you stay dry, make sure you could can I bring you an umbrella? You know, there's always a good reason to stop by and just check on your dealer just to make sure. You know? And so I gave myself that test. And when I came out of my ibogaine treatment, I said, do I need to call him and let him know how it went? Because I told him before, I told him what I was doing. This is my intention. I'm going to stop, and this is how I'm going to do it. And he said, let me know how that goes. And so when I was done, I thought, do I need to call him? And I thought, you know what? No, I don't need to call him. And then I thought, do I need a cigarette? Because that was always my second thought. And I was like, I don't even need a cigarette. I didn't even want a cigarette at that point. And I couldn't tell you, it's, it's, I don't remember ever being that happy at that, as I was that moment. Because I felt like I had been released from something. And you know, the beauty of Ibogaine is it gives you 90 days, roughly 90 days, to come back and get follow up, change your people, places, and things. And it gives you this chance. It gives, that so many addicts, myself included, did not, you know, the biggest thing you don't want to do is run out. Because when you run out, you go into withdrawal. Withdrawal from meds is pain for. Uh, withdrawal from meds means suicidal depression for a lot of people. And it always meant suicidal depression for myself. Listen. And I didn't want to go through that. Listen. So. I not in the building. So I started to help you. At that point, I said, you know, I, I didn't want to come down. So. You know, that was, that was the most dangerous thing in the world for me. I knew if I was coming down, that meant I was probably going to overdose on something. Or I was going to put myself in the hospital just to protect myself. And suddenly I had this freedom, this release from that, and I didn't have to worry about it. Um, unfortunately, fortunately I came back and I had three months of freedom from that. And I came back and I didn't change my people, places, and things came back to the same people, places, and things that I had always had. And I ended up relapsing. But that was the beginning, and that showed me, that three months showed me what, could, what life could be like. It showed me, it showed me just a small taste. I'm not even gonna say what it, it didn't show me, it didn't show me what life could be like exactly, because that took some more time. That took actual recovery, that took going in and doing some some self work, some self work and some recovery work, and I did end up going into twelve step program. Uh, I do that every I do that every other day. I still go to multiple meetings a week, and 
that recovery process combined with ibogaine is probably the most life-saving thing I've ever seen. And it's done miracles for my life. And I hope, I, I see too many, I see so many people on a regular basis in meetings every week <coughs> coming out of jail or homeless. And you know what? A lot of them are meth users, a lot of them are heroin users, and they don't really have a lot of hope because they know that the minute they stop Suboxone program or the minute they stop whatever is keeping them going, they know they're faced with withdrawal. And you just can't, you know, that's, that's overwhelming to tell them, you know, just go through it. You can do it, just go through it. I, I don't even, I don't tell them that because I didn't. I've been through it myself, but I don't want to tell them that. And I don't like to see them going through so much hurt. But I think if Bible if game were allowed here, if we could get it here, it would make a huge difference. So I'm going to focus on amphetamine and how I, I, my name is Claire Wilkins, and I'm a former and current drug user. And I uh, was formerly dependent on heroin and um, uh, methadone. I was on methadone for nine years. I found iodine and was able to karate chop a nine-year methadone dependency, although I had a month of withdrawal and was in a very short-term program. I ended up volunteering at that program in Tijuana, and which was the only clinic there. Now there are numerous, and I ended up actually purchasing that clinic and starting Pangea, forming a staff of 12, and Wes was one of the, in the first six months, we were one of the first clients, and we learned a lot with amphetamine and ibogaine. Um, Ibogaine works as an adaptogen, and Rowan um, Pasculin, who has been studying for 10 years Ibogaine in Slovenia, please can turn, uh, uh, Dana, 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 no. Dana, get off. Turn it off. Yeah. Not that's so unfair. We've interrupted each other enough. Um, so, um, Roman Pasculin did a presentation in uh, the Gita conference in 2012 in Vancouver explaining in his 10 years of study that ibogaine acts as an adaptogen, especially in smaller doses. And so what an adaptogen does, an adaptogen is a compound or a procedure or an event that actually creates homeostasis in cells. It can be something that can increase energy or decrease energy and it's found that ibogaine is an adaptogen. Now, in huge doses, it's not always an adaptogen, but it seems to do what people are lacking. So when people are coming in and they haven't slept for four days, if we gave ibogaine, you would come in on a Monday and then people would stay through Friday. I mean, the, I do a whole presentation on the architecture of emergency and how you know the most traditional uh, concepts of treating people with ibogaine are drive through like Wendy's in and out burger, and we don't work like that. We've transformed our protocol seven years ago, even more than that. And, and long-term treatment over time, and we've found that, yes, there's ceremony, and there's Bwiti Gabonese lineage, but there's also the ceremony of being human and waking up with an anxious thought. What am I going to do when I wake up with that anxious thought, like what you did? And you found, and I hear it in your language, relapse, addict. It drives me crazy when people call me and say, oh, my son's an addict. Oh, what are you? A non-addict? What are you dependent upon? What, what, what can you not live without? What starts hurting when it's not around? When you can't get your Netflix code, or you don't have your internet? When do you start, when do you start itching? Because the separation of addict from non-addict is one of the greatest tragedies of our time and causes an incredible amount of stigma. So what we start to do with our amphetamine protocol is people would just we'd give them a flood and they'd sleep right through. They finally get to sleep. So we started putting in helping people sleep and eat the first week, and then small amounts of ibogaine, and then getting them going. And then it's like, okay, oh yeah, brush my teeth. Oh yeah, eat, you know? And it's like going from zombie to human, is what I call it. And I get really, you know, I use language because I've got to slice into people who think they know it all, and that they're the doctors of their lives. They trust no doctors. They somehow handed their trust to our team and yet still fight us, even though they, I said, you pay us money and you're fighting. Like, I don't flap my lips to hear the sound of it flapping. I'm doing this for you, for us. So with methamphetamine, we <coughs> create a longer period with all of our protocols. A longer period of time, and so we can work on those things that you worked on 
you just did a week, remember? I mean, and what was incredible was that body work session. Remember? That was incredibly spiritual for you, and it's important, all these adjunct therapies. And in a week, you can't provide enough Ibogaine, sleep, adjunct therapies for people with chronic conditions. You can barely even do the so-called psycho-spiritual, which I call psycho in capital P-S-Y-C-H-O spiritual treatments, because people like to differentiate themselves and say, oh, I don't have a dependency. Yes, of course, there's a medical treatment when you're having to operate with and work with people who are dependent on benzodiazepines or alcohol or buprenorphine and you really have to watch medical things, but I'm astonished at the number of quote unquote psych spiritual people who um, have ECG issues or who think that they're doing so great and then if you say, oh, no coffee during treatment and they lift out. <laughs> you know, so, um, wanted me to talk about you know how we, we, we switched our, our protocol and he also wanted me to talk about the endocrine system. Should I go into that? Yeah, or should talk about the sexuality. Yeah. So okay, um, in Gabon and in the Congo and Ghana, um, before Howard accidentally and serendipitously discovered that this could remove heroin dependency, um, it was used as for many, many different treatments, not only to connect with ancestors and as a rite of passage, but as a medical treatment. And one of the most famous uses is for fertility. So we have had, I mean, I can't even count how many aboga babies exist after treatment. The most astonishing was a client, and I'm talking about straight stuff now, and I'll mix that, and I'll talk about the gay stuff too. Um, but with this guy, and he was amphetamine, heroin, Xanax, tobacco, like the whole, every hole that could be filled. Oh, and 7-Eleven food, he ate 7-Eleven. And he was an investment banker. He was the vice president of Wells Fargo. This is who is running our bank game. And um, he kept saying, what am I going to do about my low testosterone? He was doing testosterone shots. I said, no testosterone. This, this is, don't worry. And, and he goes, when do I have the baby? And my wife, I said, you're the baby right now. You're the six foot four baby. You know, we work on with you. And he stayed and he worked with us for a month. And he now has a one and a half year old named Maverick, who's extremely healthy. And the doctors could not believe his testosterone scores. He had no spermatozoa when he, before he came in for treatment. He was, they were, they were seeking all sorts of alternative in vitro, la, 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 la. And the wife came down and I said, if you are to work with your partner and stay together, because Ibogaine isn't just, Dimitri Mugiana says this, it's not just the addiction interrupter, it's the relationship interrupter. Every habit is going to be looked at and interrupted for a minute. When you're on Ibogaine, you're lying there, and you can't do much, you can barely talk, so it's the everything interrupter. If you allow it to, people fight it also. So this gentleman had a child, and the wife came down and actually they conceived while they both were on Ibogaine. It was a unique situation. But what happens with all people is when you're on, if you study Bruce Alexander's work and the globalization of addiction and you realize that what's happening is that we're suffering from this social dislocation and this isolation, and if you're in a cage, of course you're going to push the button for men. Of course you're going to push the button for whatever's around, man. If you're gay, what's around? Men. So, but if you have a community and you can play and you can cuddle and roll things around, there are, Bruce Alexander proved that the rats will do that instead. They'll go through withdrawal just to play, just to be with others. So what we're missing out is this concept that there's no relapse and this addict idea that we're all connected and we all just want to be, we're all, we want to be more connected and yet we crash into each other. So what happens with Ibogaine is it repairs the endocrine <coughs> system. I've seen women who are 50 start to menstruate. That's shocking. Numerous people will, on their second, third day, start to menstruate. It happens constantly. 
And then there's the issue of Claire. I had this one guy say, "Get me a woman. Can you get me a woman of the night, please?" And I brought it up at the Gita Tepo Salon conference. This notion of a compassionate sex worker. Dimitri brought it up years ago, and people come to me and it's like, God, wouldn't it be great if all of our adjunct therapies could include that? Because I can't do it. I can't sit and rub you and touch you all over. That's just unethical and probably, you know, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, you're on Ibogaine and you're in bed and you're taking blood pressures and people love, and then I believe, and I put this proposal out there and it has yet to be studied, that it produces more oxytocin, which is the bonding hormone. So if it's working on the endocrine system, and it's working on all these other hormones that are making people more sexual and increasing testosterone, well, oxytocin better be in there, because all it does is make people bond. People are like, I found my tribe, oh my god. I never connected to anybody, but now, and it's like all these weirdos all find each other and form their own little rat parks and form new sisters, and new fathers, and new mentors. So something <clears throat> needs to be discussed with IPM when we talk about this in terms of channeling what comes up when you uncap the methadone, the, the methamphetamine, excuse me, with the Ibogaine. I remember coming home, I was so lit up, and I had a boyfriend who was with me for four years who was used to me being on methadone. I was 180 pounds. I didn't want to have sex, I didn't have my period, and poop every, I only pooped every two weeks. And I'm lying in bed like, you know, like, and it's like people obsess with, I want to have sex with everything. You know, I love everything. And so what do you do with that? Like it's so, a very important thing to discuss. And it's also, there's all this notion of Ibogaine as an anti-addictive treatment or as a tolerance reducer, et cetera, but these applications are so varied, and Ken Alpert is studying the mechanism of action in order to see where does it go, and it goes to all these different places. So for all of us, we could each use a little bit of Ibogaine, and then of course, if you don't want psychedelics, that's important to know too. But for people who are, there, there, there isn't anything for methamphetamine right now. What is there? Does anybody know of anything good? Well, the only two trials that showed statistical significance were with Ritalin and Adderall. And it's not Wait, a methadone. So it's a It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, 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 it's just a st significant right. reduction, but it's not like um, methadone. Yeah. It's a reduction. It's like methadone or buprenorphine, is, yeah. you know, and, and it's also Chirac, but it's still, you're, you're, it's not an answer. It doesn't repair, and what Ibogaine does is produces GGNF and it repairs the proteins at the site of the receptor, which actually, this one cell that's just as hungry for methamphetamine goes, oh, wait, I have a choice. And it doesn't need it, you know, which is a really beautiful thing. And that needs to be studied more, you know? So how do we get that going? Like, what can we do? Who here knows people who can get it? We've got a these certain little tiny Bill's getting started, and we need to, Ibogaine doesn't want things to happen fast. It happens fast enough. It needs to happen slowly and carefully within, you know, people who are reasonable and of sound mind, because all the other people who want to take it and get near it are all crazy, you know, including us up here. And we need the balance of the legal side, the political side, the psychological side, in order to counteract what this intense root does, which can bring up trauma. I remember one person was like, oh my God, I just saw myself in a high chair being abandoned. He couldn't believe it. He's like, this is harder than ayahuasca. And what do you do when things come up? You have to integrate it. What's there a lack of in the IBM community? Integration. Everybody wants to dose. You know, I call it doser pride. Oh yeah, I hit him with 12 milligrams, 15 milligrams per kilogram. Hit them. I flooded. I flooded them. Oh, great! National disaster for the night. So my style is much softer and gentler, and it's more successful. Our success rate doubled within the first year, and, and that's what we do. And um, you know, right now I'm focusing on studies. So if anybody has any connection to 
anyone who has a Schedule 1 DEA license and is interested in a protocol, we can work on, on putting a protocol together and, and even in low doses, you know, careful low doses, you know, so. I don't know if I have much more to say. I, I'm, I'm here to just support and, um, you know, Wes is a beautiful example of, of, you know, just someone who has gone through the whole spectrum of taking IV gain, going back to the same environment, realizing there's a lot to work on, and how we need to integrate all of that together to, 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 to make it worthwhile so people we have enough reasons to dismiss Ibogaine. The fact that the population wants to take it already is reason enough for people to dismiss us. You know, someone I was just hearing saying that this was a what was the disease that someone said that this were you know an, an opioid not an opioid crisis or a methamphetamine the crisis. Plague. If it were a robotic plague crisis, <laughs> what would we be doing? <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. Psychologist. I've been in the field uh, working with people with drug issues for 35 years since I was about this tall. Uh, and um, I guess I'm really here partly as a critic of sort of what's happening in the field these days and from my vantage point as an addiction psychologist to lend my support to Ibogaine and um, you know, the importance of taking Ibogaine seriously and ultimately uh, supporting, you know, what Claire was just talking about is the research that's necessary for getting this medicine available uh, much more, I mean, widely uh, throughout this country as a response to what we're now calling the current opioid and overdose crises. Just to pick up on what you said, Claire, uh, recent data uh, suggests that about 175 people are dying of overdose every day. That's from 2016. This is a terrible, terrible tragedy. Uh, Gabor Mate recently uh, brought up in a talk that I heard him uh, give that 3,000 people died on 9-11 and it changed the world. And these data suggest that 4,500 uh, people are dying every month for the last several years from overdose alone. And we have a tepid response. We have an increased discussion about the need for support and so on. But I think that this current crisis, which, hi Norma. Um, one of my heroes is back there. Um, we're calling it crisis because it's now hitting the white community when it's been a crisis in uh, the poor communities and the communities of color for years and years and years. Unfortunately, it takes moving into white suburban neighborhoods for us to wake up. But I think that these crises are uh, offering us some opportunities because the conversation around the country uh, is uh, that business as usual has not been working. The traditional abstinence-only, one-size-fits-all treatment approach to addiction is an abysmal failure, which then sets up failure in drug users, escalating drug use and overdose. And then we have a criminal justice system waiting to pick up the pieces and lock them up. So I think that we need a complete overhaul in the system. And it's not just what we do, but how we think about what we do. I think that the data of the failure of these approaches and the data of who so-called addicted people are, or the, the population of people that struggle with 
problematic substance use, suggests that we need a whole new model. As we're not just talking about, well, and this model shift, I think, supports a new approach to treatment, which I think needs to include novel, um, new, newer um, medicines and approaches to treatment like Ibogaine. So the model shift is a shift from this old, reductionistic, simplistic uh, disease model that many of us somewhat older folks were schooled on, but I think it largely still dominates our narrative about addiction and recovery. A unitary disease that has a unitary course, unitary causes, which we now believe have to do with the, or we're told by NIDA, have to do with the interaction of the toxic drug and a vulnerable uh, ner nervous system, a brain system. Simplistic, and it leads to simplistic treatments, and it leads to arguments about which treatment is the best treatment. I think the data suggests that we're not talking about a unitary disorder, but we're talking about a process um, that I call psychobiosocial. That is that the process that we call addiction, or problematic substance use, and th this was really addressed in both of your talks, I think, that um, we're really talking about an interaction of a complex mix of psychological, biological, social, political, relationship dynamics that is really unique for each person. And that that unique mix suggests why we need a comprehensive, integrative approach to treatment where we've got many, many different modalities that we can bring to bear in trying to figure out collaboratively with each individual which blend of approaches is going to best serve you. So, I, I want to share that I, I made a post about this not too long ago and I got blasted, believe it or not, by some of my beloved harm reduction <laughs> colleagues from around the world that um, Ibogaine uh, salespeople are snake oil salesmen. You know, capitalizing on the poor, vulnerable addicts and trying to make a quick buck. Well, they exist. I'm sure they do. The fly-by-night, or what do you call them, drive-by Ibogaine clinics. You know, but it happens in every, in every uh, treatment modality. There are people that are going to step up and take advantage and sell things that just don't work or deliver services in ways that are really unethical. In every corner of Absolutely. But I want to say that one of the reasons that I've been convinced about Ibogaine is because of the people who I've met, beginning with Howard Lossoff and Norma back in the mid-1990s, who were two of the most honest, earnest, passionate, committed, loving people who, who discovered this amazing substance and devoted their lives to bringing it to the community that needs it. And over the course of these last 20-something years, I've met many people, some of whom are in the room today, who have had miraculous experiences of total transformation with Ibogaine. So while we don't have enough empirical evidence to convince the FDA that they should approve it as a medicine, I think I have enough evidence to, to, have, to be convinced that this is a medicine that we all need to support. So, interestingly, so if let's, so I wanted to say something about the, the snake oil salesman claim. It is true that the data suggests that medication-assisted treatment for opioid dependence is one of the most effective life-saving medicines. But it's, it's not an either-or proposition. I think this is one of the fundamental problems in our field, in the addictions field, that we've got these ridiculous ideological battles between different camps that have investments in different philosophies. And it's like the one truth problem. I've got the truth. It's medication-assisted treatment. Or there are Ibogaine one-truthers, too. Like, that's the panacea for everyone. In fact, we know that Every single effective treatment is effective for some people, but not for all, maybe not for most. So I think our job as, as a community, as healthy, as helpers, is to create spaces, and this is what we do in my psychotherapy, to work collaboratively with people to figure out what are the, all of these complex factors that are contributing to their problematic use of substances, 
parse them out and figure out which blend of interventions is going to really meet them or meet their unique needs. Many people are just not going to go on medication-assisted treatment. They're committed to wanting to be free of, of substance dependence. So we need to have other alternatives, and that's what ibogaine is. It occurred to me, if we think about this new model as psychobiosocial spiritual, ibogaine in the substance and in what surrounds it addresses all of those factors. There are people who come through the experience craving free. There's a biological basis for that. People come through this experience with tremendous psychological insight into the multiple factors that have contributed to their addictions. People have profound mystical trans, you know, transcendent experiences. And, and we're now finding uh, an increasing amount of empirical research coming from the psychedelic research world that mystical experiences tend to be highly associated with positive outcomes in terms of people's quality of life, their sense of emotional and, and, and psychic openness. I mean, it's a beautiful thing to see science validating the spirituality. And we've got the amazing community that's, a, that's, that's grown up around Ibogaine. That's a community of support. So as I think you were saying, suggesting, Claire, one profound experience that even addresses multiple factors that are contributing to addiction is not going to cure your addiction. In fact, I don't know that addiction has a cure. If addiction is a relationship to a, to a complex behavior that helps in some ways and hurts in other ways and is intimately intertwined with all sorts of issues in your life, you may have a wonderful transformative experience as you do, but then you got to get to work. Some people believe that the integration work, that the aftercare work, is more important than the experience itself. Because those old patterns, those old dynamics, it's not just people, places, and things. It's how we relate to our people, places, and things, our ability to manage feelings, our ability to manage our self-esteem and relationships. And how they treat us once we've evolved oh. and come back. That's what I deal with a lot of. Right. People going, whoa. Well, who are My you? mother did it to me. Whoa. Right. Don't you? Oh, yeah, so, so there's me. so much important work that needs to go on afterwards. And I think that here's where psychotherapy or whatever your approach to aftercare treatment is can both help people in the preparation for the experience, that is to really have realistic expectations of what they're going to get and what they're not going to get. And then, as I think an aftercare few weeks at Clara's place is going to prepare people to do the work that they need to do when they get back home. And there needs to be comprehensive, personalized care to address all of these complexities going forward. So I had a thought about research. Um, I do think we need research, but we also need to make the medicine available immediately. I don't know the details on this, but I do know that there is an initiative at play in New York State right now to get the governor's office to make supervised injection facilities available oh. in a research context. I think they're looking at six sites around New York State. So it occurred to me, why can't we get the governor to make ibogaine available in a research context? We can put you, Claire, together with people who have connections with the governor and see if we can get a kind of a research context available uh, that would make uh, this treatment available in a number of different places right here in, in the context of a study that gathers data to look at its efficacy and so on and so forth. So I'm really, I mean, I, I, oh, and I wanted to say one other thing. I went to the Global Ibogaine Conference in uh, Tepoztlan two years ago. Uh, I'd been around the Ibogaine community for a long time, and that was really my emergence. That was my flood dose of the Ibogaine community. <laughs> and one of the things that I uh, experienced was, this is an amazing, passionate, heart-centered, uh, loving community of people. 
And it's also a harm reduction uh, minded uh, recovery community. And what do I mean by that? Harm reduction for me is about personalizing, about acceptance, compassion, about collaboration, about support, um, as opposed to authoritarian prescriptive treatments which tell people that they're powerless and they need to do it my way. I think that is, that's what characterizes most treatment out there, and I think that that contributes to most treatment failure. Nobody wants to be told what to do and disempowered. In a harm reduction framework, we work collaboratively to empower and support people to discover their own truth and their own path. And what you see in the Ibogaine community is there's a, an acceptance of diversity. That is, recovery is defined as you define it, as we define it. And that is what I think um, is the most powerful and effective approach to supporting people in their own recovery journeys. So I'm glad to be a part of this community, and um, I'm glad to be able to support uh, as well as I can. Thank you. Thank you very much. terms of uh, treatment for various substance use disorders and other mental health conditions and kind of compare how they would uh, how you would do research with these drugs so one of the things Dana asked me to talk about is bupropion which is the uh, chemical name for a drug that's marketed depending upon the indication as well butrin or Zyban it's um, sort of an atypical antidepressant and it's also a medication assistant treatment for tobacco use disorder it's an over-the-counter drug. Uh, you don't need a prescription. It's not scheduled under the Controlled Substances Act, which uh, I will be referring to as the CSA, uh, the primary federal law that deals with drug control in the United States. Um, so because it's over-the-counter and uh, not tightly controlled, there are very few to no barriers to doing research uh, with it for other indications. Um, then there's the drug we're here to mostly talk about, which is Ibogaine. Uh, Ibogaine is an experimental treatment for opiate, opioid and other substance use disorders. It is classified as a Schedule I controlled substance under the CSA, uh, and the factors for determining that a substance is Schedule I means that, according to the government, it has a high potential for abuse, no currently accepted medical use and treatment in the United States, and that there's a lack of accepted safety for use under medical supervision. Then there is noribogaine. Noribogaine is the principal uh, metabolite of ibogaine. Um, it's not currently scheduled under the, the CSA. Um, research into this would require a, an IND application. I'm going to get into what that means in a second. Um, the patents are owned by Demorex, which is a company based in, uh, in South Florida. Um, there is also 18-methoxycornidine, uh, which everyone calls 18-MC. Um, it is a novel iboga alkaloid congener, uh, which was invented up in Albany by Stanley Glick and his team up at SUNY Albany. Uh, there are similar considerations to Ribogaine. It's not a scheduled drug. The patents are owned by a company named Savant HWP. They're based out in Silicon Valley, and they have actually filed an IND application for research here in the United States. Um, so when it comes to Schedule One substances, there are several hurdles in during, doing research. Um, first of all, for Schedule One drugs, researchers have to apply to the Drug Enforcement Administration, the DEA, to obtain uh, registration for the investigators of the study and licensing of the site. Um, as a you know, Schedule One controlled substance, um, this would require you know, a special licensing and registration procedure for both the investigators of the study and the site that would site or sites uh, later on in the development phase that would be conducting the trials. Um, and so before I had mentioned a thing called the Investigational New Drug Application, or the IND, um, this is required for any uh, research, clinical research, that's required to approve a new drug. You have to work with the FDA and submit an IND application. This process gives researchers a path to follow that includes regular interactions with the FDA to support efficient drug development while protecting the patients who are enrolled in the trials. 
Um, and so what I'm going to conclude with is just the steps. There are several steps that researchers go through in investigating any new type of drug. Um, first of all, in the case of Ibogaine or any uh, addiction medicine, the sponsor of the study would obtain a pre-IND number, which is used for communications with the FDA before the IND is approved, from the FDA's Center for Drug Evaluation and Research. Uh, in this case, there are several divisions depending on the medication. There is a division of anesthesia, analgesia, which means pain reducing, and addiction products. That's the division with the FDA that handles research for these substances. Uh, the sponsor would contact a source of ibogaine that's registered for the DA to obtain information on the specific properties of the drug so that all necessary chem chemistry, manufacturing, and controls, what's called CMC information, can be included with the IND application. And the, this CMC information has detailed information about the, the drug substance, um, how it's manufactured, the processes for manufacturing, the materials needed to manufacture it, um, formulation of a placebo, if it's a study that includes a placebo uh, control arm, uh, labeling for the drug, and an environmental analysis. Uh, the sponsor would contact the DEA for a registration application and a Schedule One license. Um, if the sponsor wanted to take CMC information from a prior IND or new drug application, for example, uh, there have been applications before uh, to the FDA to work with, um, with Ibogaine. It would probably be different now due to different manufacturers and manufacturing processes. But if there is prior art that an uh, investigator wants to use, they can get a letter of authorization from the previous sponsor or manufacturer to reference the information that's um, in NIDA's drug master file uh, with the FDA. Uh, the sponsor would send a copy of the IND and the protocol uh, to, uh, to the FDA and the DEA to reference the information that's in the drug master file. That has confidential detailed information about the facilities, processes, article used in the manufacturing, processing, packaging, and storing of the drug, as well as toxicology information uh, as to the potential risks of the drug. Uh, the FDA reviews the IND application and then, uh, assuming the FDA approved the application, the sponsor would contact a DEA registered source to get the Ibogaine or other drug after the FDA completes its review and the DEA registration is received. So that's just a quick, brief overview of the processes that a researcher would need to go through to develop any of these types of drugs. Um, uh, that's the first step. That's, the, yes, that is Not that. Not to mention the amounts of millions of dollars. Yeah, I mean, just to briefly address that, uh, for example, MAPS, uh, which is an organization that uh, many of us had the opportunity to go to uh, the conference they had on psychedelics in Oakland in April. And MAPS is uh, just about to start phase three study, which is the last stage with multiple sites, uh, multiple patients. It's the, the last stage before a drug can be approved for, for human use, and uh, they're estimating, I think, just in the phase three portion of the study, uh, I think they're budgeting for 15 to 20 million. And that doesn't include all the money that they've spent in getting it through um, through phase one and phase two studies. Which drug is that? MDMA. MDMA. Yes, with MDMA, MDMA for PTSD. Um, so I have a lot of other experience with Ibogaine. Uh, I'd be glad to talk more during the moderated discussion, but that's just a brief overview of some of the, the hurdles that we need to go through to make this um, an approved prescription medicine in the United States. Thank you very much. Thanks, Matthew.